Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Talking TSR. Uh, it is November already after Thanksgiving, and uh, to my virtual left is my co-host Rick, and my name is Chris. Rick, how are you doing? I am doing good, my friend. Uh, how was your Thanksgiving, all things considered? All things considered, I had a very quiet Thanksgiving. You get to our age, you like quiet holidays. <laughs> <laughs> Thanksgiving's an awesome holiday, obviously. Lots of cooking. I do all the cooking in the household. So oh, nice. The major, the major cooking. So mm -hmm. yeah, no, it was it was very good. It was quiet. Um, a little bit, obviously, a little bit different this year. Um, yeah. it, classically, and when I was a kid growing up, the Friday after Thanksgiving was the traditional date when we always started a new D&D campaign. Oh, so, nice. um, so I missed that part, obviously. I actually have not actually done that in a couple of years, but it was always kind of like a holiday. It's like, hey, this is a good restart day. So, mm. so I didn't do that, but I did get a chance to uh, do some board gaming with some friends over the computer. We actually pulled out the webcam and we actually played a game of Puerto Rico, which is oh, wow. perfect for on the webcam because you don't hide yeah. anything. Um, and yeah, it was interesting, but uh, it was it was good. It was you know, and I never win that game, and I came in solid second, so I was I was pretty pleased. So that's, how was your Thanksgiving? It was good, and, and that's how you can tell if you like a board game is if you don't win it, but you want to keep playing it. I always yeah. say that's. Uh, I did the same thing actually. I recently played the steam version of uh lords of water deep yep. with some of the expansions and the electronic version of that game is is pretty faithful Amazing. and it works yep. well so uh we play it a lot yeah i i've got that on my agenda for the near future again with more people hopefully because uh you know it was a way to connect it was a lot of fun but other than that yeah. it was good yeah quiet thanksgiving is true but like you said quiet after a while, quiet and boring aren't as bad as when they were when you were young. <laughs> exactly. So exactly. Yeah, it was a good one. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, no good. So we had a great episode today. Um, this is going to be the first of a couple of episodes that we're going to feature where we're going to do a, a dive into uh, the Temple of Elemental Evil. Um, and that includes the Village of Hamlet and um, the Ruined Moat House, of course, the original T1. Um, as most of you folks know, um, we uh, have given that uh, module the official uh, or treatment, as we like to call or the original uh, Adventures Reincarnated. Uh, so uh, that's going to be coming soon. Hopefully that's going to be released around March or so. So we want to do a couple of episodes um, to kind of talk about uh, the design process. And, you yeah, know, but we want to kick this episode off with talking about uh, the original T1, uh, the Village of Hamlet, um, and the Ruined Moat House, uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, the conversions that we did, um, and a uh, you know, spoiler alert, uh, Rick really didn't have anything to do with that part of the module, he, he converted the later part of the module, so, um, but we're going to talk a little bit about what we do, and we actually have some artwork to share uh, from the book that nobody has seen yet, I just saw it for the first time today, um, actually yesterday, um, and we have a couple of maps and that that we're that we are uh, allowed to share to kind of give a preview of uh, what's 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 to come. So uh, so let's uh, kick it off. Um, Rick, what is your you know opening salvo, shall we call, <laughs> um, in discussing uh, T one, the village of Hamlet? Sure, and and T one is absolutely deserving of its of a standalone show. I absolutely felt that. Um, my first. Uh, I guess semi-obvious observation, I think it's semi-obvious, is that it's a great base of operations. Um, that's something, it's helpful for any long, uh, long-term long campaign, and, and as stated on the cover of T1, you know, it says something like introductory to novice, so it's, you know, Gygax's way of saying it's for beginners or for new campaigns. So the fact that they give you a really nice base of operations that's pretty well developed for the DM, you've got a temple, you've got the Druidic faction, you've got, you know, the inn and all the kind of necessary, um, you know, utilities for people to buy things. Uh, I think you got Rufus and Bernie as a sort of NPC agents, perhaps to deliver future missions and information. So uh, that's one observation I've got right off the bat that I think uh, forget the adventure just as a base of operations it's really nice um, when you go into the adventure and we can get into that deeper uh, you know there's issues I, I absolutely love part, parts of it but parts of it I find very unbalanced and 
I think kind of like the temple itself, it suffers from that escalating, swiftly escalating difficulty level. And it can get excruciating when you get down into the moat house, for instance, uh, Larith the Beautiful, you know, spoiler alert, if nobody's ever played it. It's kind of the big bad and he can be devastating against, especially, I can't even imagine first level characters going up against this guy. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. things like that, it could get, it can get a little hairy down there and, you know, we can go into that, but uh, yeah, th that's, that's my opening salvo is I would say a uh, good base of operations, you know? Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think that's, you know, it really gave us the template for here is going to be a small village um and then here's a nearby dungeon and then you know here's like you said your base of operations uh, the keep of the borderlands did a very similar thing um this had a little bit more detail than the keep in the borderlands um um and that was and that was great you know and um you know we're going to talk about some of the different things that they that the tools that they did give you um but um i, I always looked at this module as um Gygax giving out some tough love for the DMs out there because yes, everything was there, all the pieces were there, but you really kind of had to figure it out on your own. You had to kind of figure out how to move move along, um, you know, through the village um, and and dealing with the NPCs. And again, you know, back in this back in this time frame, you know, role playing was not that a big of a thing. So you know, you get you give a a a, a village of of NPCs and, you know, the novice game master, you know, in fifth grade or sixth grade, like I was back in the day, you know, didn't really know what to do with all of them, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and wasn't really sure, like, are we supposed to attack them? Are we supposed to talk to them? And, but, you know, there was very sparse notes on what information they had. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you could tell there was something going on, obviously yeah. with the ruined moat house, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't made blatantly clear. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that was, you know, definitely that frustrated me as a, a game master back in the day, the, the village part of it, but then the ruined moat house part was, you felt right at home there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that was it. Oh, here's the dungeon. And it's yeah. like, okay, we know how to do this, but you know, sometimes getting from point A to the village mm -hmm. to the dungeon point B um, was a little bit tricky in my yeah. opinion in the original. Yeah, I think that's a really good observation because you're given a whole lot of suspicious individuals, but you're not really given A to B linking them to like the traitors. They're evil. Great. How do you get from there to the moat house? So, uh, I, you know, I found in my years running it that often, you know, good old Rufus and Bernie often would give people a little push when necessary. Yep. Um, and like you said, just the sheer openness and amount of NPCs, you know, Gygax has a little sort of pep talk in the intro where he tells people, you know, play it to the hilt, but it's hard. Uh, I think to this day, one of the things I, I love, but also address kind of with, you know, DM fear is like running these inner city campaigns, you know, these, these big city campaigns where the characters can go anywhere and, and up any street into any shop and any temple and talk to any NPC because as a DM, you just have to be ready for anything. And the village is a little like that on a smaller scale. So uh, it not the greatest, perhaps it might be good for new characters, but I don't know if it's good for new DMs. <laughs> you know? yeah, so uh, yeah. yeah, that's a really good observation. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's how we played it. I mean, that was our base of operations, and that was an and 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 that tradition is gone. My, actually, my kid just played it a couple of weeks ago in his oh, nice. uh, in his Friday night group. Um, I didn't even know about it. I don't think they even knew that I had actually recently <laughs> done the conversion. It's funny, actually. Wow. Um, I I had actually printed out a map of the ruined mo house because my kid was looking for it. he's like hey i need a bandit lair that's and he described it to me and i was like oh well i've got the perfect one for you and i printed the map mm -hmm. out and everything and then you know he's telling me about his adventures and i'm like he's telling me oh we encountered a giant tick and then we encountered a giant lizard and i'm like oh wow this is sounding very familiar little mm -hmm. did i know that's what he was going through and he actually had the map right next to him and didn't oh, wow. realize it that he had the map and everything and, and it was it was it was actually pretty ironic but wow. but that just, just goes to show you how loved that module is where yeah um, in 2020 it's still being used to introduce yeah. low-level characters to kind of the old school um you know template if you will of mm -hmm. Of this is how you do it you have a yeah. village and then yeah. you have a dungeon nearby and i was and it's funny how you said rufus and um 
burn you call bernie i just call him burn it's gonna burn like yeah bernie. maybe it's burn i don't know yeah I don't know. <laughs> bernie just sounds like weekend of bernie <laughs> i know we get up bernie's <laughs> yeah we get a bernie's at the village of hamlet um but no it's funny i always used to use the druid as as mm -hmm. the guy who gave the push and only because i was just always fascinated with druids and rangers when i was yeah. in my formative days playing and everything so so I always had him being kind of like the mastermind that kind of knew mm -hmm. everything in the region. And he was the one that, cause, cause it seemed to make sense to me more that, you know, he was in tuned with all the animals of what mm -hmm. was going on. And he was the one that gave the push. And then it was your, it was your job to kind of figure out to get to the Druid in the first place. Yeah. Well, they, they definitely set him up as a, an mm -hmm. agent of information and, you know, something I, I kind of thinking back on the module that I think is interesting too is, it's one of the only modules I can think of off the top of my head where Druidism is kind of treated as a regular religion where yeah. you're, you're told people in the village, well, these folks follow St. Cuthbert and these follow people follow Druidism. The old things. Yep. I've run into plenty of char you know, player characters that are Druids, but there usually isn't a lot of love given or even thought given to their followers or, or their services or where, where in Hamlet, you can sort of picture the Druids sitting down in the grove and kind of lecturing to people. So it's, uh, or at least I could think of that. So I thought it was interesting the way that was treated too, that since you mentioned the Druid, you know, um, yeah. but yeah, absolutely developed. I, I mean, there's certainly enough agents of good sprinkled about, I, I guess that the player characters can anchor on. It's, it's a matter, I guess, of the DM picking one and kind of rolling with it you know, and using that as guidance. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting that you say templates because, you know, now that I've just said that it's hard for new DMs, like one of the do things I do love about it though, is that at such an early time in D&D, &D, it offered such solid templates of certain things like inns and things that, you know, I think now the average DM you know, you have an in in your head and you kind of know the basic requirements and you're like, well, yeah. we've got, you know, the, the common room and we've got maybe a private room and we've got the bar and a kitchen and I don't know, some private quarters, you know, for the per person who owns it. And, and, you know, and you maybe some storerooms or wine cellar downstairs and you kind of, you know, you tick off these things in your head. But at the time the village of Hamlet came out for me, especially at a younger age as a new DM, it was really important because it showed me what was supposed to be in an inn. And I, you know, at this point, again, we've seen so many inns over the years, but I think it, it can't go without saying what a great first template that was by providing, you know, uh, uh, a template of, you know, room by room of a, of an inn and room by inn of a church, you know, and laying out the church of St. Cuthbert, again, kind of maybe in a sort of opposition or um, in comparison to the Druidic Grove. And I feel like those are really good examples for new DMs to kind of show them how it's done. Like this is a, Inn of the Welcome Wench is a perfect example, a perfect template of an inn. So, uh, to me, that's worth noting because I love that, the fact that they they do those. And I just love those building maps in, in general. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one of the things I realized kind of going back and thinking about this module was that I, I fell in love with the 3D versions of like the map for the Inn of the Welcome Wench. But those didn't come along until the mega module. They didn't come along until T1 to 4. Uh, and I think a lot of people even confuse that, that, you know, they think of those more 3D-ish sort of uh, Sutherland versions where in the original module, all the module, uh, all the maps were top down. So they got an upgrade. They kind of, you know, even though it seems like they, they largely kept the, the T1 the same when they put it in Temple of Elemental Evil, they, they snuck some map upgrades in there. So they gave it a little love, which was, you know, yeah, which was really nice. Um, yeah, given given the maps, so let's see, there was the map of the, the the inn that made sense. Yeah, there was the map of the church. There was the map of the traders barracks. Traders, um, yeah. And then there was the map of the, that was it. The three maps. The well, three the maps. tower oh, and, and the tower also, yeah. but it really kind of implied. And I remember when I was first reading the module that something should happen in these places. Yes, yeah. like yeah. something. There should be some kind of action, exploration, something. Um, yet there didn't seem to be supporting material in the module about yeah. it, um, which I always found a little bit confusing. I was like, well, all right, well, I've got this map of the church. And like you said, that's great. All right, now mm -hmm. I have a map of a church. And like you said, I probably looked at and And yeah, I mean, I've, I've done that before. My classic example of, of using things as a template is the uh, 
um, the Sea Ghost from uh, Secret Assault Marsh. Mm-hmm. That that's the first time I yeah. I came across a ship map. Yeah. yeah, and I used that many times to base a ship off of. Um, you know, when I needed a ship in my campaign, I was like, mm-hmm. oh, hey, I don't know exactly what a pirate ship looks like, but there's a great one here that I could probably use and tweak and, you know, move some things around and, and make it kind of my own. So mm-hmm. um, I, I do remember that. I just also remember being like, wow, what do I do with these maps and this <laughs> yeah. key, you know, and I'm like, something must have to happen here. And, yeah. But it didn't seem to happen like especially the church i was like there's nothing happening at the church yeah, the, except for going to get healing and the the church you know. is sort of the most and i love the fact again that it's detailed and that it's in there but i agree it's it's you could have characters not even just walk right past the church yeah. <laughs> and like yeah. it's it's literally optional yeah i mean it's a good resource for the player characters for perhaps healing or what have you but uh you're right it's it's kind of um and even the traders establishment there the traders can be an important point in that there are two obvious, you know, agents within the, t- the, the village, but the map, as I recall, it just kind of lays out where the goods are. It really doesn't give yeah. you their quarters yeah. or give you their secrets or their treasure or anything. It just kind of yeah. says, well, the saddles are over here. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. this pile. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's uh now plot wise, there's not a lot of, a lot of help there for the DM. Yeah. Um, like so. you said, you really have to, you know, you have to push and yet, there are so many good really classic encounters right in in the book you know oh certainly yeah um, so here's another thing that i always found a little bit frustrating that the names of the places in the original module um you didn't have blacksmith shop and mm-hmm. trading post you had things like and i'm looking at my notes to make sure i get this you know well-kept dwelling with a sign yeah or average farm building with yellow shutters or shuttered windows and stuff like that and and that was obviously a little bit that title was a little bit of description that obviously yeah. you could use but that was not very useful to remember okay this was the smith and yeah. this was the trading uh the trading barracks and this was the yeah. you know just the farmer and this was the the foxman and whatnot so um that always um kind of perplexed me a little mm-hmm. bit too and i remember my original module my original one i had i had the pastel colored uh was the original one i i picked up the green cover um a couple of years ago at gen con um but the version that i always had was the pastel one and that was the one that i remember jotting my notes in and everything and mm-hmm. and i remember making those those notes and everything so i don't know if you remember that part about the fact that you know that was that was again yeah. guy Gag squeezing every little bit of description out of every little word every yeah. word was important so and, and that's it i took it the same way you did that it was sort of meant to be almost like a primitive box text you know like this is what the players will see is is a, a farm up. with worn doors or whatever a good you know a house with yeah. well-kept shutters or whatever but you're right as a dm except for a few obvious businesses um you know like uh, the church or whatever i always got mixed up what was where you know mm-hmm. there were a lot of interchangeable buildings and and things and uh yeah that needs help <laughs> basically um so why don't you talk about some of the things you like? What like what are some of the encounters? I know at least one off the top of my head that I won't. I, I know you're going to mention, but uh, what are some of your favorite encounters? And in in so so yeah, definitely the the classic encounter um, again. And there's absolutely no rhyme or reason why this encounter sticks out in my head. To, mm-hmm. Probably for the what happened to my hapless character, probably. But but uh, the the very first encounter before you even get into the ru- ruined moat house um the giant frog attack yeah um and and at the time i had a gnome illusionist thief and you can see where this is going i got swallowed mm-hmm. and 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 lost my character right off the bat um and that probably made the encounter more special but it was it was crazy just to have those tongues attack and get stuck to you but they didn't do any damage again that it was it was it was kind of it was novel. It was like, wow, yeah. okay. And the attacks, if I recall, the attacks were easier because they didn't have to, you know, they kind of ignored armor class. Um, if you recall in third edition, you had the old touch armor class mm-hmm. versus um, flat-footed and all that kind of stuff. And, it, and I really kind of dug that. It's like a, a tongue 
should be pretty easy to hit you, even if you're wearing plate mail and carrying a shield, because yeah. it just has to stick to you, basically. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to penetrate your armor and all that. So um, so I was fascinated um, <laughs> by that encounter. Um, and again, yeah, I lost the Nomad. I also learned a very valuable lesson. Make sure you have a one-handed bladed weapon with you at all times mm -hmm. that you can pull out, um, because the sling didn't do any good to me when I was down in that frog's gullet. Um, and, uh, so that I do remember that encounter, um, mm -hmm. and then the other encounter that really, really resonates with me. And, and again, no real reason why it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a very simple encounter. Um, the giant crayfish, yeah. which, which I think is a classic to many people too, but literally yeah. it's a crayfish in a pool and that's about it. And Thorne is sharing some of the brand new artwork from, uh, uh, the or book. So he's putting that up in between as I'm talking about these classic encounters. <laughs> um, and again, there's, there's, there's not, there's not a whole lot to it, right? except for the memories probably, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was fascinating when my son went through the module a couple weeks ago and sure enough, they were ambushed by the crayfish and mm -hmm. they all beat foot out of there because they were like, it was some big demonic thing from, you know, and everything. I'm like, no dude, it was just a giant crayfish. But like, you know, I mean, growing up, I know exactly what a crayfish is. And then, you know, running into a 12 foot long one was scary, you know, I mean, especially. And that is a classic encounter. You know, for me, that's one of my classic encounters from this book. And I've, I've tried to think over the years, why the hell that is such a class. And I mean, you know, it, it gets cover treatment, you know, in the mono, uh, yep. monochrome kind of version. So, or the pastel version. So, you know, there's that, but I think it was just, it's not expected. It's simple, but it's sort of unusual characters, even kind of going down this dungeon. They're not really expecting it be facing something i think exactly like a crayfish you know and it's set up in a very insidious way of a sort of you know here's a pool with you know maybe some goodies in it very first edition and then you know you get a little too interested in the scroll or whatever it is or some gold pieces or something and then this thing kind of lunges up at you so uh i love the crayfish you know yeah um hard dungeon definitely uh yes but you yeah. know I love the moat house to death. Um, I always definitely found there was like a difference between the upper level and the lower level because the upper level, especially in hindsight now, you know, on experience is very simplistic. If you read through it now, it's kind of like, oh, a few rats here, a lizard here. There's yep. quite an abundance of critters just kind of sprinkled about Yep. Um, with not too much, you know, fanfare. I think that the spider in the tower, they kind of give his tactics a little bit, but most of them are pretty cut and dry. But then once you get below, you know, it gets real and it gets difficult fast, you know, and you've got green slimes and you've got a, a crypt area where you can basically get hopelessly lost if I've if I always treated it properly. Um, and kind of like you, I, I like the frogs too, because that was like your early wake up calls, the players that it was, uh, you, you know, you might've had one or two run-ins with hostile NPCs, but there probably wasn't a lot of monster fighting before that point so yeah. i think for I've, I've run the module multiple times and and in a lot of cases the frog encounter was really the first monster yeah. fight yeah the characters have and he he sets it up with such a great introduction you know gygax yeah. i loved you know we've talked about his little it was only like a paragraph or two but his tiny little uh, introduction to d2 where you're entering the uh koa toa shrine and he describes the leeches and the underwater and and, you know, he gives this beautiful description of the, you know, clinging burrs and the, the you know, the weird croaking sounds, which, you know, foreshadows the frogs and these things around the moat house where it kind of tells you, okay, you know, you're out of the woods now, Dorothy, it's, you're in evil land. Yep. And over the years, I used to go back and juxtapose, like, um, you know, do a sort of juxtaposition where I would read that description before the moat house and then read the description which is kind of very similar before the actual temple of elemental evil, which gives a totally different description, but also implies, you know, there's evil all over here. And it's, it's really interesting to look at the two because I love those descriptions of Gygax. They set the stage for mm -hmm. that frog encounter so well, it's almost like Lovecraftian. He gives a lot of love to the, the, the description in a way that I wish more modern modules did. Uh, yeah. So a good, a good uh, wake up encounter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, know? yeah, really. And, and and in general, most likely the very, like you said, the very first combat encounter of a yeah. campaign, basically, you know, yeah. um, you know, almost definitely. 
um, unless they have some random encounters, but there wasn't any random encounter tables at that point um, in the module. So, um, but yeah, so that was that that was certainly a, a great launching point. And I agree. It, it also, I think it kind of taught me a little bit about dungeon ecology. Um, and, you know, just to, you know, you're not going to have a whole bunch of lizards, but, you know, you're going to have one lizard, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, and there probably needs to be a source of water nearby and there probably yeah. needs to be shelter and, 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 and everything. So I, I thought that was probably the, the, the brilliance and the simplicity of it, mm -hmm. even though it was a bunch of, there's a spider here, a lizard there, a giant tick there. Um, it all kind of made sense, you know, it, it you know, it, it, it sort of made sense and you get down in the dungeon a little less sense, but you're right. And definitely the, the, the scales, the, the scales tipped away, you know, there was an ogre oh, yeah, down yeah. there. Uh, there was a yeah. lot of zombies where you could yeah. get, you know, coming from different, different directions. So yeah. yeah, there was, there was a lot going on. And then, and then, you know, then you had the, the, the bandits and you had, you know, the guards and, and then you had uh, Larith, the, the, the big bad. So it was interesting because there was just enough there to say, hey, there is something going on here. It's not yeah. just the giant lizard, a giant tick and, yeah. and a couple of things and a crayfish, even though we might remember those encounters. But there, there was there was more and there was something else. And mm -hmm. and that was the that was the ultimate tease. And, you know, back in the day, I remember when I first got the module and bought it, I didn't know there was going to be a, a sequel. I didn't know that there was a, eventually I found out about it, but like at the time, yeah. I didn't really know where this was all going. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, it, it really was kind of like up to you, where is it going? Yeah. And then, you know, it was like six years in between when that module came out and when Temple actually came out. I mean, that's, that is six years. That's just, that's a lot of time. That's a lot yeah. of time in between. Yeah. Um, and, and again, no internet people, no, no, you know, no social media, no, no updates, no weekly or monthly updates yeah. from TSR staff on what's going on. You just didn't know. And yeah. oftentimes you didn't know until you saw it in the store. I yeah. mean, that was pretty much how you that's got how I knew. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's how, how I knew I, also. Yeah. As I said, in so, you know, previous interview or something, that's, you know, how I knew about the temple was I just, walked in a game store and I saw the cover. I said, Whoa, okay. Yeah. You know, it, it, it kind of came back to me, but it's, it's telling that I've run, you know, more than twice as many groups through the village that I have through the temple. So, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, cause a lot of those groups were no longer around when I got to the temple, frankly, you know, my the play groups or, or what have you, um, you know, and I think I started with the village of Hamlet, like in high school or something. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, since we mentioned that the Moat House, I have to give love to the Moat House illustration, which uh, I believe Trampier did that one. Mm -hmm. He has that lovely dark kind of uh, wood woodcut kind of style. I love that elevated shot of the Moat House where you're kind of looking down in the ruins and you see the crack because it instantly when put with the floor plan it makes all it all makes sense you understand mm -hmm. the tower you understand mm -hmm. the kind of levels up as you first enter you know there's a couple uh elevations and again nothing earth shattering in that the rooms upstairs could just as well be dungeon rooms underground separated by quarters mm -hmm. and yet i always found the idea of the moat house so interesting that to this day, when I look at that map, I want to grab it and clear it of critters and fill it with my own stuff, you know, yeah. because I think it's just such a cool map. And, you know, castles and keeps and things like that don't get a lot of love. And I think I don't, my theory is just it's because they're hard to do. I think a they lot are. of DMs, frankly, and, and this is not a diss on DMs out there. I think a lot of DMs just don't have that knowledge. They don't understand keep construction and castle construction and, and you know, uh, defensive placements and, and how exactly things would be organized in a lot of these structures to design a keep properly. Um, you know, it's hard. It's a lot harder than just plunking down a few square rooms, you know, separated by corridors. Um, and yet it makes such a more interesting upper level you know it makes such a uh, sets the stage in such a cool way um and it's funny because the moat house was that and a few other things that came up in earlier modules were my inspiration for like the very first goodman product i ever did um which was a module called the scaly god and kind of somewhat unusually uh, unusual instead of doing a regular length module as my kind of you know 
inaugural effort or whatever for Goodman Games, I kind of ended up doing this like double length book and I had a keep in it and I had a three level dungeon and really kind of went nuts. But I got very ambitious and I kind of put this challenge on myself to design a keep. And part of that was inspired by, you know, my keep in the Scaly God. I was inspired to do that in no small part by the keep, or I should say the moat house in uh, Village of Hamlet. You know, and and that taught me the hard way that it was really hard to design the keep and, and understand how the levels link up in the stairways. And, you know, eventually some fan made some kind of 3D model, I remember, of my keep from my adventure. And when I saw his model, I realized the building would be more squat than I had pictured it and not as tall. And, you know, like I didn't even understand, you know, how how, you know, elevation would work properly, I think, with all the stairs and things involved, you know, until I saw it, you know, visualized until this guy who was like an engineer put it out on 3D and I really got to see it. It was such a cool thing. But that was all driven by the moat house for me. So. I absolutely adore that illustration. And, you know, again, the fact that they give you that map plus the illustration, plus the little helpful, you know, this is what an arrow slit looks like. And those little, you know, mm -hmm. kind of illustrations they threw in there for good measure. Is there's a couple of good books, you know, for DMs out there that, you know, there are sort of books about castles, but it's hard, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, I just, yeah. I love the Moat House to death. I think it's just, you know, absolutely worth the price of admission, you know? Yeah, yeah, I, I would say I faced that um, very similar in um, when I designed Castle White Rock. Now, Castle mm -hmm. White Rock, I couldn't wait to get down into the dungeons, but then I was like, "Whoa, it's a castle! Mm -hmm. I need to have a castle part." And my castle's not much more than like a building with some rooms and a tower and a gatehouse, kind of. And it's like, you know, it didn't really come out to be a castle, but um. Yeah, because again, I'm not an engineer and I didn't really think that all the way through. And and yeah, back when you're you're trying to figure these things out, you're like, well, just give me that 10 foot corridor and, and rooms <laughs> and whatnot. And and who knows what the rooms originally were. It doesn't matter what they were. Now it's you know, now it's a harpy lair or something like yeah. that. So um, but yeah, that definitely was was a, a, a challenge to uh, make that. Uh, translate uh, mm -hmm. into the next one. So just want to give a sh shout out to uh, Shade of Icarus uh, is uh, posting some comments on there. Um, says he kind of misses the the bookstore surprises. I, I agree. I don't know how you yeah. capture that these days. You can't. I mean, everything is kind of out there. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm learning that, you know, announcing a product is actually legally a very important thing, <laughs> an important step. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it, you're right. There's probably... Um, yeah, I guess probably the closest we get to it is, is those gamers who, who maybe played the Indian college and then have been away from it and just happen to be in a Barnes and Noble or, or a, a game store or something and come across, you know, a fifth edition player's handbook and are awestruck by it. And, and you hear a lot of stories about that, that, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many people playing fifth edition now that that's you know they just stumbled back onto it or that or a co-worker or something like that or yeah you know it's just so much more um it's so much more accepted now that you know you you hear about it in in casual conversations or on popular tv or mm -hmm. or you know on whatever so um that's probably the surprises you get now but once you're once you're kind of you know a gamer if you're a gamer these days yeah, yeah you're not really surprised by anything um if anything you know you're you're playing the waiting game because you yeah. packed something on kickstarter and now you have to wait a year for it to come out so yeah i think gamers are so plugged in and informed these days but like you yeah. said at least it's all acceptable it's sort of you know we're living in a comic-con sort of culture now and you've got stranger things and big bang theory and all these shows kind of you know throwing D, &D culture out there so it's it's cool <laughs> yeah you know it, it, it makes it good yeah um, and, and shade with another great comment yeah the, the the what's new with goodman games seminars are probably as close as you get to that because uh yeah that's yeah. when we actually announce new products and and you know or or tell you yes the product is is close or it's close enough to the point where we feel confident that we're going to put it out there to the world. Um, and, and that, that is, that is probably as close as you're, you're, you're mm -hmm. definitely going to get. So, so I, I, one more thing, you know, I, I don't want to gripe too much about the classic module, mm -hmm. but, you know, definitely when you give a 5e conversion treatment to something as beloved as this, you really do um, see all the warts um, mm -hmm. that, that, that the module um, has. And again, 
by nobody's fault. This was the, these modules were first of all. I mean, you know, it was it was really done by Gygax and by Menser uh, later on, who finished up off of Gygax's notes. So you had those issues, but but um, you know, the the treasure um, that was handed out in this mm. module or potentially handed out in this module was just absolutely do absolutely <laughs> ridiculous i mean we had to, we had to put a section in the introduction about yeah. kind of a you know you got to be really really careful i mean there is some there is some glaring um glaring things with treasure i mean and i mean you look at some of the peasants in in the the village i mean they have tens of thousands of gold pieces of yeah. things um and a, know, lot of one, <laughs> a lot of good jewelry a lot of good jewelry silver serving <laughs> sets that are 6000 gp and gems and you know jewelry jewelry and and you know hidden in a in a stump of a tree out back or whatever you, you probably weren't going to find it but still it was a little a little too much and even when she got into the the ruined moat house too i mean Larith had mm -hmm. had over oh, yeah. twenty thousand gp worth yeah. of stuff and several magic items that wouldn't yeah. normally have um you know that and again if i recall his armor class was like 20 negative no, one. 20, negative one negative one negative yeah. one which is like the equivalent of which 21. Is, yeah, which is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's like ridiculous. you're barely going to hit. I mean, yeah. you know, as 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 a first level character. First level, you need like, in first edition, you need a, a 20 basically to hit. Yeah. Unless and, you're a fighter, maybe a 19. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and he could heal himself. And it was yeah. just kind of like, you know, it was, it was, it was a hard, it was really, if you didn't, if you didn't have the right composition of party net. So that was one thing that just always kind of stuck out to me. And it was, it was, you know, and I, I remember, um, a couple of those early modules where, you know, back then we're kids, we didn't know any better. I was playing in games where we literally going from house to house and, you know, robbing peasants. I mean, cause that's what we did. We didn't, we did, you know, we were, we we're literally in fifth grade and, and it was like, if they list treasure. But you know, that's a really good point because the level of detail, even in the inn in certain places, I think frankly was written with that in mind because a lot of the earlier yeah. modules and even like the earlier I don't know, like Ed Greenwood modules, like for the Forgotten Realms and things. Mm -hmm. You could tell they were written in that, you know, gold pieces equal experience, you know, i.e. my players might pillage this place mm -hmm. if I don't keep them under control sort of way. Yeah. Because again, realistically today, I don't think the average player, they wouldn't find any of these treasures. I don't think 90% of them, you know, it, it tells you, well, you know, buried in a crock out in their backyard mm -hmm. in the manure pile is, you know, a bunch of gold pieces. And this guy's got, you know, his, his silver necklace stuck in the highest knot of a tree. And this guy's got this thing, you know, buried under this flo loose floorboard in the back shed or something. <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's, you know, the if tools. the characters are maybe walking up to the houses and talking to these people briefly, I, I, you know, unless they're pillaging the whole village, I don't think they would come near any of these treasures. Yeah. So I think it was written in that mindset that there were going to be a lot of players that were just going to go through their like cutthroats and, and find looking for any little valuable they could. And, you know, it, you, yeah. it shows its age in that way. I think the way that, uh, but I agree with you. The treasure's ridiculous because you're you're going from right characters that can barely afford armor, and and they tell you in the introduction like you can kind of afford the horse you're riding in on, and that's not much else. That's about it, yep. And then all of a sudden you find you know twenty thousand gold pieces enough that you know the, any fighter could go out and get himself a, a suit of shining plate mail. So it's kind of uh, yeah, it's very in in typical first edition fashion. It's very extreme. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think yeah, it was, it was so. wise to put a little note in the fifth edition version of that. Um, but yeah, we should start talking about, I guess, the uh, original adventures reincarnated version. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's get it on. Yeah, sure. So, you know, why don't we delve into that? Because I think okay. we're at the halfway point. Yep. Um, and again, yeah, as Chris mentioned, uh, you know, truth in advertising, I worked on the temple part. I didn't work on the uh, village, even though I am familiar with it. So I'm going to, I'm going to, let Chris do the majority of the talking here. Um, so, you know, off the top of the bat, what would you say was the hardest thing you had to address as far as like, you know, a, you know, translating some kind of first edition concept into fifth edition yeah. for the order? So, so I, I think folks understand our, our design philosophy with these now at this point, since five of them are out. But so we do a straight conversion of the original. So we're, we are not balancing these encounters at all. We're not taking any treasure out, even though we know we probably should. Um, that's why we put notes in there on how to adjust things. And we, we do, we call out, I call out specific encounters 
of what you can do. So, so the, um, the village and the ruined moat house are, are straight translations to fifth edition. Okay. It's exactly the same. If there was whatever frogs were there, we even had to create slightly different frogs because the frogs were not all the same, um, mm -hmm. according to the player, the, uh, the monster manual. So, um, so that's, that's our first line design philosophy. So we didn't really change anything in, okay. in these, these parts here. Um, but what I did since I was the one that actually um, worked on uh, the village and, 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 you know, that's, that's the advantage of being the project manager of this. Like we had a team of four people, um, you know, when you're, when you're the person in charge, you get to pick the pieces that you want to work on. And of course I wanted to work on the village and the ruined boat house. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was like a, a slam dunk. So, um, so I didn't change a single thing, but what I did do is I went in and I added a bunch of different things to really, um, help the the beginning game master out um, in running this adventure, mm -hmm. um, and um, so we we talked about a couple of the things already. Um, one of the things that we designed for this is a DM's aid, a big table that summarizes all of the encounters in the village, um, and it lists that original name of the you know shuttered house with blue with with blue paint. Um, but then it actually told you this is the mm -hmm. smithy or this is the whatever. And then also lists the NPCs that are all there and what their religious affiliation was and, and mm. who, they're, who they're allied with. Um, and if most folks remember, most of the NPCs were not named actually yeah. in the module. Yeah. And I struggled with that. I, mm -hmm. one hand, I wanted to name them all. Um, on the other hand, I didn't, I named a few. Um, and then there were some that were named that would stay the same, but I did put in there a, a, a pretty exhaustive table of random names that you could determine. And in that mm -hmm. DMs guide, that DMs uh, handout that we created, uh, we put a spot that you could record the name. If you, if you get a photocopy of that page, you could actually record, you know, okay, the Smith's mm -hmm. name is, you know, Larry, you know, so that you could kind of keep track of that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was that was the first thing we we um another thing and this and this amazed me actually if you think back to the old encounter uh, old modules uh, there was no rumor table yeah in yeah. in village of Hamlet and in uh, for the rune mo house and and one of the big issues was how do you get the characters from the village yeah to the ruined mo yeah. house and and again you know most of the old grognards will tell you well all the tools are there yeah they're there but, but you need to kind of figure that out yeah. and you need to kind of figure that out ahead of time. Um, and so we gave you some of those tools to do that. So we gave you a rumor table um, and there's probably five rumors in that rumor table that kind of points you directly mm -hmm. to the ruined moat house and, and points you also to some of the NPCs that know about the ruined moat house. And it's crazy. That's such a good addition because it's crazy in my mind that there's no rumor table. I mean, I know yeah. I know rumor tables kind of came into fashion more at the end of first edition and really the advent of second edition, I think, is when they became a thing. But yeah, I mean, you know, there certainly are some classic modules that had rumor tables. And like, this is a module that because of the investigative nature of it, so benefits from a rumor table because, you know, yeah. Otherwise, it's there's so much as we discussed kind of pre-show. There's so much on the back of the DM, you know, for this that I like yeah. to say it's you know for beginning characters, not but not for beginning DMs. You know? Exactly. Yeah, uh, that definitely. I just wanted to call that out. That's a great addition, I think, of, of the rumor table alone, just to help player. And, and I go nuts with names. I I have one player that I don't know if he likes to record the names. Or he just wants to test me as a DM, but he will ask the most obscure, you know, if I tell him, you know, three kids run down the street past you as you enter the city. Oh, uh, what's their names? Uh, you know, and I've got to quick yep. come up with something. So uh, I feel the pain there. So that's that's good, too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? definitely. Um, so the other thing that I added and and again, I went back and forth on this one. I actually added it to. The introductory chapter because i did not want it to actually kind of put it in the chapter with the village mm -hmm. um but i actually created um i called a, a a prelude to hamlet is on the road to hamlet your very standard um attack by bandits mm -hmm. um and the bandits are bandits from the ruined moat house and i give you know some clues on there and how you can figure them out and mm -hmm. one of the bandits is actually the spy in in the town 
Um, Mm -hmm. and he's got a very noticeable scar. He gave him a noticeable scar on his face so that, you know, Mm -hmm. if you, you know, but however, he's he's got like a fake bandage on because he looks like he's wounded, but, you know, the bandage could fall off during combat and, you know, you might be able to see that scar and then you might run into him in town again later on. Um, Mm -hmm. He'll definitely know about you. Mm -hmm. Um, But I I designed that as another possible link of, you know, because they they allude to that. They allude that there is a lot of bandit activity and null activity in, in the region. Um, so I figured let's give, yeah, I was either going to give him a Noel encounter or I was going to give mm-hmm. a bandit encounter and Noles are tough for first yeah. level character. Yep. Um, you know, I could probably have given him like two Noles, you know, or three yeah. Noles maybe, but, yeah. but, um, and again, it, it was just more to rough up the PCs a little bit, kind of mm-hmm. get them into the thing, but it's purely optional. I didn't want that to kind of yeah. overshadow, um, some of the original material. So I saw so I mm-hmm. even put it in the background and, 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 and Tim and I, the editor, we had a, a, a pretty long conversation about where we should put that, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I just felt that it, it, it kind of fit better, not in the chapter with Hamlet. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that's why I called it the prelude to Hamlet yeah. um, to kind of just flesh that, that connection between the bandits and the moat house and give one more possible uh, avenue mm-hmm. um, that you can make that connection between the two. Yeah. Um, and give the PCs, you know, a good story to tell when they get into town. Like we were just jumped by bandits. Does anybody know about mm-hmm. this? And that's that's a perfect thing mm-hmm. to get them, you know, at the inn or wherever yeah. they or one of the farms that they're in. And then, you know, then absolutely the, the game master's got a nice launching point then to say, oh, yeah. you want to go talk to, you know, yeah. the druid or you want to go talk to 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 Bernie and mm-hmm. and and uh, Rufus. So, yeah. Uh, so we added that as well. Yeah, that's a good because any like you like you know again like we discussed kind of pre-show there there just aren't a lot of connect the dot moments there for the DM to kind of put these things and even for the players to put these things together. I think you know that's one of the the breaks we see between the earlier design of a module like this and maybe what you would see today is there'd be a little more hand holding, a little more helping the DM kind of lay out a nice logical you know connection of clues. Um, yeah. because as we know, you know, you and I have written like modules for publication. Anytime you're going to have any kind of mystery, you've got to put more clues in there than the players will find anyway, because they won't frankly find them all. And exactly. it's, it's hard. It's, uh, I could see a lot of players spending a lot of time rolling around Hamlet and even running into one or two unsavory characters, but still not necessarily being pointed to the moat house. And yep. in my previous, like my own runnings as a DM of the module, I've had to give them a little push in the right direction via, usually in my case, it's via like Rufus would tell them, you know, or the cleric or somebody would kind of point them. One of the agents of power, if you will, in the village would point them in that direction. Um, And there's enough of those people, but like, yeah, like having an initial bandit encounter gives them a reason to talk about it or if if they get banged up in the, you know, in the encounter and they need healing from the church. Well, now they're talking to the church, you know, the clerics of St. Cuthbert or something, you know, and, and the DM's got somewhere to go with that. Um, so yeah, modern, you know, modernizing it a little bit. Um, did you touch the wilderness at all, like kind of around the moat house or around beyond that initial introductory encounter? Yeah, so we we actually created an entire chapter of wilderness encounters. We made it like a sandbox, very similar to um, pulling inspiration from B2. Mm-hmm. on how you uh you have actually some encounter tables for all the different terrains for all mm-hmm. the areas around the moat house around the temple around the village um and then we actually designed uh, several um set encounter areas some of them uh with little mini maps and have a you know a little bit of an area to explore like for example i i was kind of determined to put a knoll layer in there mm-hmm. so um so we've got nearby knolls and and mm-hmm. because they're got to be coming from somewhere i mean there's they they reference them in the module um, so we've got Knowles, they've got some other insa- unsavory characters around and then some random, you know, large creatures that, um, that, that live. So we, we tried to shoot for that to make it again, it's a separate chapter, um, mm-hmm. and, and to make it a little bit more believable because, you know, there is going to be as expected some travel in between the village and, yeah. and, and the other village of Nolb, and we'll get into Nolb next time when we, yeah. that'll be our next part. We talk about the yeah. temple um and then there, there's definitely some wilderness adventuring that can be had there so we actually have a couple of interesting sites um and again some of them to actually push the story forward some of them are just random mm-hmm. you know um uh, critters in, encounter to kind of keep things uh, liven up and everything um and uh and you can get into some real trouble real quick out in the wilderness too so mm-hmm. um you know that that's that's kind of always a a, a staple as well yeah. um so uh so yes yeah, so we did add that 
mm-hmm. um, as well. And then just some simple things too, like, um, you know, uh, I believe it was in B2 or maybe it was actually in B4. Um, I love the fact that there was a glossary that was included at the end of all these terms. So, so um, I, I wanted to make sure we had a glossary of what we call the Gygaxian terms, because he always <laughs> he comes up with some crazy words that, yeah. you know, when you're in fifth or sixth grade, even sometimes today, yeah. you don't know what that word means. And you're like, what? Yeah. And it's like, it's, it's fascinating to, you know, every time I told all, all of my writers, I was like, oh, anytime you come across a word that mm-hmm. you, that you either don't know what it means, or you think the general populace won't know what it means throw it on a list and send it to me. And, and I think we ended up with, uh, you know, I don't know, probably 50 terms at least yeah. um, that are just a, a collection of things. And again, just one more thing in there just to kind of make it a little bit easier yeah. um, for the game master running it. Um, you know, and again, did we have to do that? No, but it was actually kind of fun to actually yeah. do that and look up. Yeah, no, because and... Gygax wrote, and I love his style, but he wrote in that sort of drier, more academic style. He used yeah. a lot of words, his, his war gaming background showed whether it was you know in keep construction or or simply things like the bandits the wide variety of equipment that the bandits have makes a very difficult encounter i think for dms because you know this guy's got a shield and a spear and this guy's got a halberd and leather armor and you know you could tell the wargaming roots were showing there so you know gygax might have known what knew uh, known what merlons were but maybe the you know the average Yes. dm would not so <laughs> yeah. yeah there was a lot of those uh battlement terms and yeah and like yeah. you said you learned a lot about the, you know things right out of an engineering book on just exactly what all these different things were um and that was fascinating in my opinion and i thought that was that was useful because again that kind of sets the stage for like you said when you when you sure. start designing your own things um that really gives you some inspiration oh yeah on, on those as, I mean, as a kid, I liked having to look those things up, but it's kind of like, it's so, nobody's going to know half those terms. I think even now, yeah. you know, a lot of those terms are going to fly over people's heads. So it's good to provide that. Yeah. Um, now going to the moat house again, since that's my favorite, did you add anything like extra rooms in the moat house or did you add extra strategy or notes or anything in that way? Um, so one of the things that we, that I always do is, and sometimes it's inconsistent. This one had, I believe some encounter areas had the read aloud text, but not all of them. Mm -hmm. So, um, we added that, we also added that to the village too. I don't Mm -hmm. believe many of the village areas had that read aloud text, but we, we added the read aloud text, uh, for all encounters. Um, and I think even in the temple, once you get on the temple, I think it was a little inconsistent too. I think it was yeah. more consistent then because again, yeah. that was written in the mid eighties versus mm-hmm. the late seventies. Um, so that was, that was a true ad. I originally, when I first um, uh, came into looking at this project, I was like, oh, I'm going to do an, an, another level of the moat house because that, how cool would that be? Let's give yeah. a third level or side mm-hmm. level. I wanted to do a hidden level. Mm-hmm. that even um that even larith hadn't found um and it was gonna it was gonna be some kind of elemental thing actually it was kind of like i was gonna build into the backstory of like that's why larith was there he was mm-hmm. looking for this this hidden thing but ultimately it felt too much like the temple and mm-hmm. they're gonna be getting you know four levels plus of the temple yeah. soon so yeah. um and 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 some of my initial concepts when I actually went and reread the temple, I was like, oh wow, that's exactly the type of room that you know I was thinking yeah. about having over here. So mm-hmm. it felt redundant. Mm-hmm. Um, and then once we started adding other parts of the design and and just how huge this book and this book is going to be huge, folks. I mean, it's going to be two <laughs> yeah. books most likely um, in a slipcase, but. Um, it just got to the point where adding another, you know, 10,000 word sub dungeon, you know, it just, it probably wasn't going to add anything to it. Yeah, it was too probably much just going to be additional. So, so I, we decided not to, to, to go with that. Um, but we did add a couple of, it, of, of, of some nearby uh, wilderness encounters that were pretty close to the, mm-hmm. to the moat house um, and, and links in to get to the, uh, to get to the other village of Nolb and to get to the temple. Um, so really there was not a whole lot change. There was a couple things, you know, I named the gnome Mm -hmm. prisoner and, you know, gave him stats and, and a little bit of a, a little bit of a backstory. Um, and, you know, you could certainly make him 
uh, a replacement uh, PC. I remember that's what happened to me when I lost my my gnome. Um, that I got I got another gnome back in in mm-hmm. that you know that was that we, that we freed from the ogre. Um, but in general, uh, didn't 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 change um, okay. um, really much of it. Uh, kind of kept it uh, very similar. Now I did um, uh, embellish a little bit on the story part of it and everything. Um, so what I do on these projects is is I always look for anything that's um, uh, official material on the book and everything. And and most people don't know, but back I believe it was right when third edition was coming out. So I think it was kind of between second edition and third edition, mm-hmm. early two thousands. Um, Wizards of the Coast, this is right after they purchased d and uh, put out a bunch of novels. And uh, mm-hmm. I've got my novel right here. Oh, you probably can't see it because of my back. And there it is. There it is. Um, so there was a whole bunch of these novels for some of the classic modules. Mm-hmm. Um, so I always usually get those and read those. Uh, there was a Keep on the Borderlands one. Mm-hmm. Um, not the best novels in the world. Uh, I'll be completely honest with you, but actually Temple of Elemental Evil was actually quite good. Mm-hmm. It was mostly the ruined moat house and and the village. Um, and then there was a little bit in the temple. Um, not a whole lot of adventuring in the temple though. Um, and it didn't really get to the nodes or anything like that. So, um, but it was, it was, it was a good read. Um, they did some interesting things with Larith, which I will not spoil. Um, mm-hmm. But I did actually incorporate some of the novel into our mm. version of the temple. That's a little bit of a tease for next time yeah. uh, when we get into the doubt. But there was a couple of things pulled, uh, kind of pulled directly out of the novel mm-hmm. um, that I thought would be kind of neat to kind of canonize it, if you will, mm-hmm. and bring it up to date. Because I thought it was, I thought it was a pretty good idea. Yeah. cool so cool yeah he could you know obvious potential there you know for uh long-running plots or a long-running villain or a return villain or, or a bunch of things there's uh or i think anyway um, oh yeah yeah and and again a lot of it was setting the stage for that Mm-hmm. um and again it wasn't a lot of like 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 for example they don't say anything if larith escapes they don't right. really give yeah. you any details on and anything um you know so i i added some i added some extra stuff for that and actually even in the temple i i have an area where larith could possibly pop pop back mm-hmm. up in a temple if, if for some reason you get away because i mean yeah. Quite, yeah, we talked about how overpowered he was yeah. really he should probably try and escape i mean yeah. i mean yeah. ideally you know, you're probably not going to defeat him completely, but he's got enough mm-hmm. mooks with him that you should probably be able yeah. to, you know, get busy with them. And then he makes good his escape. And then everybody loves a reoccurring villain. So, yeah. The um, last time I ran this, Larith, he did his darndest to escape. The players did not let him escape, but he mm-hmm. certainly tried. And I think, you know, without going into a long winded backstory, basically my longest running kind of recurring character was an evil cleric that got away from the players at one point really by happenstance and then I decided to bring him back and he became a real thorn in their side and I think having that experience then that same group of players starting new characters and going into this dungeon when this fellow tried to escape they were like no way (laughs) (laughs) I think they have visions of me haunting them with Larith until the end of their days so they weren't going to let it happen but just for the reasons you describe you know he, he you know he's got underlings and he kind of can use honeyed words and whatever it takes to kind of you know wriggle his way out of there um so that yeah that's that's cool yeah, um, pro- probably more likely than defeating him with his armor class and the magic weapons that he has yeah. and everything oh so, he's and, a tank <laughs> yes and then and, and, and yeah in the very sense of the word he's a tank um and and really um what i think was a, a good story element to have him escape so that you don't have those overpowered magic uh, items fall into the player character's hands. I mean, he's got like a ring of invisibility and a cloak and uh, uh, I, I, he's got a bunch of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, you really don't want those things falling into the PC's hands at that level. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. and, 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 and it could very well be that was Gygax's plan all along that, mm-hmm. you know, it was not a foe that you were supposed to defeat. You were supposed to go a couple rounds with him and figure out why we cannot hit this tank. Yeah. The tank is probably a really good way to describe him. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you probably should have, but you know, those, those rules weren't really in there. That that's insight mm-hmm. wasn't really in there. Um, yeah. so, uh, but that's probably the best way to run it. But then if that's the case, then, you know, there probably should have been a lot more details to, okay, is he going to pop up in Nolb? Is he going to pop up in the village sure. of Hamlet and come yeah. back at you in the wilderness? Or is he going to show up somewhere in the temple? Yeah. So, um, you know, so that's, so we, we did do a little bit of that 
Um, you know, and again, more to kind of just plant those seeds to the mm -hmm. game master, like, hey, yeah. do what you want to do. Um, yeah. you know, change what you want to change that's going to fit yeah, your Yeah, but story. here are some tools, right? Exactly. Yeah. And this will get your thought process going there, but you don't necessarily have to do what we what we yeah. say you do. So um, before we wrap this up, I don't know if we showed them any maps from the new or book yet. Do you think we should preview a few maps? Yes, uh, I think Chris, Thorin was case? kind of showing those off um, earlier on. So, um, oh, OK, I want to make sure we haven't shown not all of them. Oh, all right. Well, somebody voice says, but no, that's I, I think we shared. I think we shared quite right. a bit. Um, as long as they went up. All right. I wasn't yeah. sure if we showed them all. So, okay. Bunch of. Yeah. All right. Let's let's give them a taste. Yeah. yeah. Since we just there talked about go. surprises and previews being so rare in this electronic age, let's. Yeah. So now we get. It's, yeah. So give it's them something gorgeous. To... Love it. So, <laughs> nice, and you got both there too. That's really cool. Um. And yes, uh, Shade of Icarus is still a thing. Yes, uh, two volumes. It, it sounds like we haven't gotten to that point yet, um, but I think it's going to be in a slipcase and it's going to be two books because it, it was it was massive. Again, we had a team of people working on this, um, uh, which was essential because there was so much material. Uh, the original yeah. module was 128 pages. Oh, and there's the map of the uh, uh, the ruined moat house. The um, yeah. you know shooting the the battlements and the side view there. Love that little side view shot yeah. there of the, yeah. the battle. It really so sets cool. the the theme of of what you're really kind of looking at there. Yeah, that little helpful kind of you know illustration. And I can I can testify that this was a whopper. This was a big and and yeah. the regular ore books are big. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. The size of this module—if you go pull it out and look at the original—it's it's a hefty book. Um, yeah, we didn't we didn't add a whole lot of new material to this no. simply because the size of it and it was yeah. still getting kind of out of control. I mean, we kind did some of, cool yeah, things. We'll yeah. talk about in a in a later episode. We're gonna talk yeah, about exactly. We could what go we in, did. but it's for almost for the yeah. reasons you said. At least for the parts I worked on, is I went into it thinking, oh, I'm gonna add a wing here, and then once. I kind of was reminded of how ponderous the dungeon was, you know, and how many rooms are in there and how many kind of areas are covered. I was just like, Oh my, it's almost overkill, you know, but yeah, uh, exactly. Cool. So, all right. So uh, with that, I think we've uh, teased enough for uh, our future episodes. So again, we will yeah. have another couple of episodes on temple of elemental evil. We're going to spread yes. these out a little bit. So, um so hopefully you guys if you like talking some temple hopefully you guys will come back and we'll the next episode we'll talk about Nolb and we'll talk about the upper temple and then maybe like level one or something yeah. like that so yeah gonna ease our way into it so. yeah we can definitely get a, at least two more episodes out of uh oh yeah the temple definitely. a lot to cover there um so all right i think i think yeah we're at an hour so yeah we're we're getting better we're, we're hitting that hour mark yeah uh so I guess to tell them about the next episode, um, but before I do, uh, the, the usual kind of reminder slash plea, if you're listening to us, uh, watching us on Twitch, uh, of course, feel free to give us a follow and, and keep you know sharing your comments. We'd like to read them. If you're watching us later on YouTube, of course, subscribe if you haven't already or, or give us a like, it's helpful to us and leave comments there too, because we do get in there and read them. Um, and, you know, don't be afraid in your comments to suggest books that you'd like us to cover, because Chris and I, you know, we've got our favorites, certainly there are books that we feel are deserving of, you know, future shows. We've got some things in mind, but you know, we don't Egg know what Phoenix. your favorites are. <clears throat> yeah. What's Egg that? Of Egg of the Phoenix. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, uh, my horse. So, <laughs> so, you know, but tell us what you guys would like to see covered as well. You folks, um, you know, and we can give those books some love, too. Uh, cause we want, we want to be able to, you know, cover a whole range of books. Anyway, our next show is taking place Sunday, December 20th at 8 PM. And our subject for the next show is going to be the monster manual two, And that is the original monster manual two by Gary Gygax. So, yay, we're going to have some more monsters. Uh, I'm sure Chris and I will manage to wriggle in a, a list of our favorite or most useful kind of DM critters in there. Um, again, that will be at our new time, same as this show at 8 p.m. on December 20th. Um, and that date is kind of like right in the midst of the holidays because it's right, right? It's right after Hanukkah, right before Christmas, Kwanzaa. It's kind of right square in the holiday. So I don't know. Maybe we can, maybe we'll squeak some kind of holiday element in there. I don't know. We, we'll have to talk about that, right, Chris? Well, <laughs> at least be some eggnog. 
<laughs> yeah, something. Yeah, we'll either yeah. we'll either toast them or give them, you know, our top three recommendations for DM gifts or some, I don't know, something. We'll have to yeah, talk about go. it. That's a good idea. <laughs> so, classic gifts, yeah. Sounds but good. anyway, we hope you will join us then for our next show, December 20th. Uh, and now we're going to move to our pearls of wisdom for the show. And we are going to let, I'm going to let Rick go first because I feel like I'm stealing his all the time. So, so <laughs> I'm going to give we, him. because we think too much alike, my friend, you know. Yeah, so I'm going to give him um, his his shot. And we do have another a comment in the chat. Palace of the Silver, Silver Princess. Princess. Perhaps. Yeah, I could see interesting that. Interesting history to that module it, There as is. Well. That, a very interesting history and, yeah. and and an interesting module too. So that, yeah. that, that, yeah. that could, I could see talking yeah, that we could Yeah, we could make yeah. some hands out of that yeah, i think that we could do something with that and yeah just for the talking about the various printings of that module we could have some fun show some unusual art um <laughs> so thank you for for the suggestion um pearl of wisdom that's where i was i was trying to find where i was at uh, my pearl of wisdom related to the village of hamlet uh going back to the base of operations would be and again this pearl of wisdom sort of mine are usually directed for the dms out there would be to you know think about setting up a base of operations when you're at that point when you're new in the campaign or fairly new at the campaign certainly before the characters reach third level i would always suggest giving them an optional and emphasize on the optional base of operations that is give them a detailed area whether it's a city or a village or a town or a wizard's tower or a fort or even a den of you know dwarves in the mountains some sort of semi-civilized safe haven full of, you know, some detailed NPCs and some secrets and, and reasons to go there, whether it's, you know, information or people can give them information or healing or what have you, you know, reasons to go back and throw that out there. And, you know, you don't want to railroad your characters, your players, and, and you, so you don't want to put too much detail perhaps into it in for, at first, but I would encourage at least setting up an optional base of operations. And then if the players find themselves going back later, you know, it's something that can really, you can really build an interesting campaign on that foundation. Um, and even in my current campaign right now that's based in Greyhawk, I have used the city of Hardby on the uh, on the again in the world of Greyhawk as sort of my base of operations because I put some interesting NPCs in there and places to go and eventually the characters had to defend the city from you know hordes of humanoids so it gave them a sort of sense of ownership and perhaps it's not still to this day as detailed as I'd like it to be but it's it's come to be a nice base of operations and I think of that when I give my pearl of wisdom so that would be my pearl of wisdom is uh, you know Excellent. think about setting up a base of operations all right that sounds a good one so so my pearl wisdom um is quite simply uh don't be afraid to change um a module and don't be afraid to you know just because an author said it's this way or something like that doesn't mean that has to be uh the only way if you think you can come up with a better plot device or a better ending like we were talking about with Lareth, um mm -hmm. you know basically escaping and maybe you're not supposed to defeat him um yeah i mean do that and do that and and use the you know whenever you're using a published module you have to go under the the assumption that you got to make changes to yeah. fit your campaign um it's only natural so mm -hmm. that should be part of the process part of the process going in is is what you know hopefully i don't have to change too much because then it's like doing yeah. all the work again but but if there's some small little details that you need to change to to kind of streamline things or you just need you know your players you know that they won't pick up on this clue for whatever reason but you know hit them with some bandits and they'll figure it out you know then then by all means do that i mean just because you're buying a published module doesn't mean that it's it's you know because again when you're designing a module you cannot account for every little clue every little thing part of it is the excitement of these is is being at the game table and not knowing yeah. what's going to happen so and, and you know what's best for your group as, you exactly know, dm and, and, know your target audience right and and we can tell them chris that you know even when we write our own original adventures as opposed to you know kind of restoring an adventure like this we're not insulted if people change we expect that yeah. it will be changed we expect that dms almost as a matter of course will make a lot of changes so exactly 
kind of goes with the territory and it's expected. So yeah, yes. good advice. We, we don't get too attached to our stuff. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, all right. So with that, well, we're, we're, uh, we'll come to the end of the show. We, we thank everybody as usual. Um, and I uh, hope everybody has um, a good couple of weeks here leading up to all the holidays, uh, in between yeah. the holidays. Um, everybody be well, be safe. And uh, we look forward to talking some TSR with you guys um, in a couple of weeks. Take care. All right. Take care, everybody.